today's plan is to continue with uh, funny kinds of arrays and array operations, you know, uh, non-trivial ways of looking through multiple arrays. And then uh, at the end of today, uh, we will start getting into 2D matrices. And just like arrays, 2D matrices can also be dealt with natively by the C++ compiler, or you can use some library packages to do it. Okay. In this particular case, the standard C++ library doesn't have, as far as I know, options for multidimensional arrays and matrices. So we will use uh, an external library called Boost. Okay. Boost is readily available on Linux systems. You can just install it using apt or synaptic or whatever your package manager is. If you are on a Windows or some other platform, you can readily download Boost from a website and install it on your computer. Okay. Uh, if you need help installing Boost on your system, the sysads, uh, the junior TS can help you out. So today we won't really do much with Boost. I'll just show you how to include the files and use them to declare arrays and do very basic operations on matrices. Okay. Most of today we'll use native uh, multidimensional matrices. And more specifically for at least this week and next, we'll never go beyond two dimensions. There's enough to do with two dimensional matrices. Okay. So coming back to um, sparse arrays and uh, how they're represented. So remember that the easiest way to represent sparse arrays is a couple of vectors. One vector records the dimension or the index in a dense array where you would have stored the vector if you could afford the space. And the lower vector is a value array. So you're saying in that dense array, which I'm not storing explicitly, index number 11 had value 2.1. Index number five had value 4.3 and so on, okay? Uh, so the other indices which do not appear in the upper row in this table are implicitly with value zero. And the whole point of storing it this way is that I don't have to store all those zeros. If the fraction of zeros in the original dense vector is much larger than half, say, then it makes sense to store the array in a sparse format. Uh, the trade-off is, of course, that operations get a little more complicated. So you sort of have to address things through the, uh, the position or the dims array now. So for example, if you are provided the array, where the dims are not in order, then to set it in order, we have to do some kind of sort, but now the sort key, okay, the value on which you are sorting is the upper row, not the lower row. So you use the values in the upper row to permute the columns of this matrix, okay. Uh, and the lower row always travels with the upper row. So unless the two cells in a column stick together, the vector becomes meaningless. So in the first step, uh, if I'm doing selection sort by sweeping a frontier from left to right, then at fx equal to zero, where fx is pointing to the very first column, leftmost column, I find that the smallest dim is two and it appears at position three, zero, one, two, three, right? So what I do is I swap the zeroth column with the threeth column. Okay. And uh, that results in the following array, 2 and 3.2 have moved left, 11 and 2.1 have moved right, and 2 and 3.2 are now excluded from the remaining sorting because the frontier has now swept past 0. So now fx is equal to 1, so I start at the 1th column, and now the minimum dimension to the right of it is 5 in position 2, okay, 0, 1, 2. And at this point, I have to swap the frontier with the minimum, and again the value, the lower row, has to travel with the upper row. So after the swap, it becomes 5 and 7 and 4.3 and 6.5. Okay. Now after that, um, my frontier has become 2, but now the minimum position is already 2, which is 7 itself. So one more position is already sorted. So I sweep fx one more, and now fx is 3, so I have the last two cells to sort. And the minimum position is 4, and the dimension at the minimum position is 8, shown in yellow. So now I have to swap the last two columns, and that results in a finally sorted or canonical representation of a sparse vector, okay, where the dims are in strictly increasing order. Fine. So now to recap, uh, we have covered the basic representation of a sparse array as a mapping from indices or dimensions to values. 
And we have figured out if it is not provided in an already dim sorted order, how to do it. Okay. And once you do that, then many operations become easy. For example, taking the dot product of two vectors or taking the sum or difference of two vectors, we now know how to do that. Okay. As we get into matrix algebra, we'll see that there are other operations which need to be ported to, say, sparse arrays. We'll see that in due course. So any questions about representation of sparse arrays? So for example, sparse arrays are a natural representation if you have to store polynomials. If you have a polynomial which looks like 2 times x to the power 37 plus 5 times x to the power 101, then all you need to store is the power and the coefficient. So that's a natural representation of a polynomial. So this is the code which implements that selection sort on sparse arrays, which uses dim to calculate the minimum position, but then does two swaps at once on both the upper and lower rows together. So the next uh, artifact we will study is indirection or index arrays. And the motivation for this was as follows. Suppose you have a data vector or data uh, array, data dn, which consumes a lot of bytes. For example, each item in the data record, uh, in the data array could be a string, and the string could be fairly long. Or every element in the data array could actually be a large record with your first name, last name, your parent's name, your city of you know, stay, your uh, name of your employer, your address, all kinds of things. If you package all of this up into a record, which in C and C++ is called a struct or a structure, which we shall study after midterms, then the number of bytes or bits in every element could become quite large. Okay. Now, in both the sorting methods we have seen, there is a considerable copying of data involved. In case of selection sort, we have to detect that minimum element and pull it up to the front and push something back. That involved copying the whole record. If the record was just an int, then it's just 32 bits. But if the record is a complicated record like this, then it might take a lot of bits movement. So can we avoid this? And uh, there are multiple reasons to avoid this. We shall see examples of that. The idea was to create an indirection or a permutation array. Pause, think of it as a permutation array. So that um, as you clock up px, pause px will dance all around the place, but data pause px will become increasing order. So here is the example. Suppose the data is these uh, you know, six strings, which I'll just use one character for simplicity. Uh, so Z, P, A, Y, B, M. And we want, therefore, pause to be 2, 4, 5, 1, 3, 0. Why is that? Because the smallest element A appears in index 2, 0, 1, 2. Okay. The second smallest element B appears in index position 4. That's why after 2 comes 4. Okay. The third smallest is M, and so that's 5. So in other words, the ith cell of pause should contain the index of the ith smallest element of data. That's the definition of the pause permutation. Clear? So in the table, uh, you see that the first column shows i as the index which sweeps through pause. Pause i is as written in the second line, 2, 4, 5, 1, 3, 0. But now, if you look through where data pause, what data pause i is, you'll find that it's a, b, m, p, y, z. So that's in increasing order. Okay. Now, um, so one fact that many of you should know is that any permutation can be represented as a composition of loops or cycles. Okay. So zero, okay, we'll look at that a little later. So how do you find the indirection array? So last time we saw that. Um, we start with a vector of strings, say names, which is suitably filled with animal names in our example. And pause was the permutation. NN was the size of both of those things. Initially, I uh, set up pause to be the identity permutation. So pause i is equal to i. And then I do selection sort on this. I only move data around in the permutation, but not in names, which is data here. So fx is equal to 0, fx less than n, plus plus fx. Find the smallest string among the positions pause fx to pause nn minus 1. So observe that in standard selection sort, we were finding the smallest element between fx and nn minus 1. 
Now at all times, we will look at names through pause. We will never inspect an element of names by itself. Okay. And then we do the swap. So I push back a bunch of animal names into uh, names. And then uh, I created the identity permutation in pause. And then here is the main sorting loop. Uh, frontier goes from 0 to n. Uh, min pause is minus 1. Now I create a minimum name, which is the plus infinity of animal names. Okay. No animal name is larger or equal to this. And then uh, I sweep the minimum searching iterator mx from fx up to the end. And if the minimum name is greater than, instead of names mx, I have names pause mx. Every time I access names, it will just be pause. Okay. Then min name is assigned to names pause mx, but min pause will be mx, it will not be pause mx. That will tell me how to permute pause itself. So after I find out the minimum position, I uh, swap only the pause array between fx and min pause. Okay. So you saw the demo already in the animated slide, so I'm not going to repeat that. And then finally, I'll print uh, pause. Okay. If you want, uh, I can show what is happening step by step. So we'll see. Okay, so so initially, at the very first step, let me uh, print out pause before starting out anything else. That should be just the so we start with the identity permutation. Now, we search between beginning and end for the smallest animal, and that's alligator. So I need to bring 1 up to the front. So 1 and 0 are interchanged. Okay. Now, I look at only, so the first position is now done. I only look at the data array at these indices. Okay, so alligator is effectively left out. Alligator is already done. So I look at zebra, z giraffe, wolf, lynx, and jackalope, and ask which is the smallest among them. Okay, and the answer is giraffe. So now I swap these two, zero to become two zero, and now one and two are done. So I only look at the original data array in position zero, three, four, and five. Zero, three, four, and five, and now the smallest is five. So I swap 5 and 0 and so on. Okay. So is everyone clear about how the pause array is being generated step by step? At the end, we have 1, 2, 5, 4, 3, 0. If you access data in that order, you'll get a sorted set list of animals. Right? Any questions about this? So how to compute an indirection array or index array? So an obvious question for you is, uh, we used selection sort because it looks simple. Naturally, you don't want an n-squared algorithm. You would like to use an n log n algorithm, like mod sort. So can you generalize mod sort to generate an index array? So try this out. All right. So how can you use indirection arrays? Well, some of the reasons are obvious. You want to access them in uh, sorted order, and you don't want to actually move around the data. But here is uh, an interesting problem. So suppose each element in an array called customer CN, or data, whatever it is, is 1,000 bytes. Now, as I was saying, this can easily happen because I'm trying to package name, home address, employer, work address, date of birth, all these fields into a struct, which we shall see soon. Now, pause CN will sort without physically moving the records within customer CN. 
But suppose we do want to restructure uh, cast CN to be physically sorted by name. Okay. We might want to do that if we want to then store the customer array on disk. You know, generally speaking, most companies will have customer arrays which are too large to store in RAM. Many companies will have that. So you would like to store the customer array on disk. And now if you want to do some calculation where you need the customers in increasing order of anything, okay, suppose you want to get the customers in decreasing order of total sales to date to find out the, your most important customers. Okay, if you depend on the pause array to do that, then pause uh, CX will be jumping out all over disk and that will take a long time. So remember I already told you that disks are best accessed in sequential order of bytes. So for this reason, you may want to reorganize the customer database to be sorted in whatever your sort order was. If you are sorting by customer name, then that's one order. If you are sorting by total sales to date, then you might want to store back the customer array in that order so that you can access it fast. So we can always do that by using another array called tempcastcn. Right, so we can write code which looks like this. So remember I had the customer array, but I also created the pause array. Okay. And now suppose I create the new tempcast array of size cn as well, then all I have to do is for i equal to 0 to cn minus 1, Right, so this loop will create in tempcast a sorted version of the array in cast. Fine. But the problem is that I'll be using twice the amount of storage. Okay. So what if this 2x space is not available? So as I was saying, permutations can be decomposed into cycles. For example, our old table with animal names. Um, had these values for i, pause i, and data of pause i. Fine. So let's pick out cycles in it. So I go to 0, 0 maps to 2 in pause. So let's trace back to 2. Now 2 maps to 5. Okay. 5 maps to 0. So 0 loops back. Fine. And that's a cycle. So we can write out the cycle like this, 0, 2, 5, and forget about those elements. The element, some arbitrary element that's not covered yet is 1, that maps to 4, 4 maps to 3, 3 maps to 1, and we have loopback. Okay. So that corresponds to another cycle which is 1, 4, 3. So what we are saying is that the permutation given by pause can be decomposed into these two cycles. 0 goes to 2 goes to 5 to 0, 1 goes to 4 goes to 3 to 0. Okay. So now uh, it should be reasonably clear how we can exploit cycles to permute and sort the data array in place given pause. So a swap is just a special case of this. Okay, if I'm trying to rotate a cycle one position forward, what do I have to do? I have to preserve one value, keep overwriting, and the last thing I plug in from the preserved temporary value. So this may not be the be a correct pseudocode. So let me actually uh, write this down on paper. So suppose I have uh, my original array let's say is uh, looks like this these are the indices so let's call this px okay. and then let the strings here just for shorthand i'll say z a g w l j okay, so that's data px or names px or customer px whatever you call it so that's data px and 
if you went through the selection sort, you would find that pos px should be 1, 2, 5, 4, 3, 0. This is a slightly different example. So the indices are different. Fine. So now let's start uh, at 0. Okay. So let's say I want to do this in place copy. I start a copy cursor cx and I have cx equal to 0. If cx equal to 0, then data uh, cx is equal to z. So let's remember that I started at 0 and remember that the first value I looked at was z. Fine. Now let me do this assignment. I will do data cx is equal to data pause cx. So I am starting to rotate the cycle. I am advancing everything to the next value in that directed cycle. So what happens if I do that? Effectively I am doing data 0 equal to data pause 0 which is 1. So that results in data 0 being overwritten with a A. But luckily I have already preserved the Z so I am not scared. So my data array now becomes A, A, G, W, L, J. So observe that there are now two copies of A here. So now um, I do the following. To walk over one link in the cycle, what I have to do is Cx equals pause Cx. Okay. So that becomes equal to pause 0 which is 1. So Cx has now become 1. Okay. So in the next step, I just continue. I say data 1 equals data pause 1. What is pause 1? Pause 1 is 2. So that is data 2 which is equal to G. So now my uh, data array has become A, G, G, W, L, J. Okay. So at this point, I step up Cx to be equal to pause Cx which is 1. So that is equal to 2. Right? So next step is again, you know, the data assignment. So data of 2 equals data of pause of 2. What is pause of 2? Pause of 2 is 5. So that is J. Okay. So what is my uh, array now? A, G, J, W, L, J. Fine. I am just looking at a cycle and taking the next element of the cycle and copying it to the current one. Okay. As a result, there is always two copies of something okay. temporarily. Okay. How many people are comfortable with what is going on here? So I started out at a position 0 and I kept doing two things. One is data of Cx equals data of pause Cx. So pull over the next value in the cycle to the current place and then step over to the next position. So that meant initially Cx was 0, data 0 used to be z, I overwrote it with data 1 because pause 0 was 1. So the first position became A as well as the second one. Then Cx changed to pause Cx. So Cx became 1. Then I wrote data of 1, again it is always data Cx equal to data pos Cx, that is the basic template statement and the other is Cx equals pos Cx. So there are two steps you execute in a loop. Right. So in the second step uh, what happens is data 1 <coughs> gets assigned to G which is data pos 1, pos 1 is 2. So now it becomes A, 
G G W L J. Then C X steps over to pause one, which is two. And then data two from G gets assigned to data pause two, which is five. And that takes the data two to value data five. J. Okay, so now there are two copies of J, just like there are two copies of G here, two copies of A here. But I've preserved the original Z. I'll fix it when the time comes. Okay. So what happens in the next step? So the next thing that happens is C X equals pause two, which is equal to five. So now I could try to do the following. I could say data five. Equals data pause five. Okay, what is pause five? It's zero. Okay, so that is equal to data zero, which is equal to a. So that would be wrong. I don't want that. I have looked back. The first cycle has closed. And it's pretty easy to detect that, which is this zero is the same as the value I remembered here. As soon as that happens, you should not be using data pause anymore. You should instead replace it by whatever you remembered here. Okay, so we'll replace this wrong computation with just. Whatever I was storing in temp, and that finishes one cycle. Okay, so once that happens, your um, new value of data will be a g j w l z. This is what came from the temporary variable. Clear? So this has exhausted one cycle, but this one cycle doesn't cover the whole permutation because. These two has remained unsorted. Okay, so let's keep track of what C X has been through. C X started with zero, then it became one, then it became two, then it became five. Okay, so basically I'm now done with zero, one, two, five. Those still remain to be done. If you follow the same procedure starting from any one of them, you are now going to get a Relatively trivial cycle with two things. Okay, and that's like a swap. So shifting things around in a cycle is a generalization of swapping between two things. Remembering one, pulling it out, having them do a musical chair, and then insert the temporary at the other end. Fine. So overall, what does it give us? It tells us that first, I can, you know, no matter how big the records are, each record, each array element could be a thousand bytes long. I don't care. I can write an efficient sort routine which only creates a permutation array. And now, given the permutation array, I am going to fix the original data array to become sorted in at most linear time. So the number of data copies you are doing in a cycle is just the length of the cycle. The sum of all the lengths of the cycles has to be n at most. In fact, there could be trivial cycles with only single-tail elements in it that will reduce your time. If something happened to be in the correct sorted order by accident, then you're already done. So in the worst case, you are going to get a linear amount of data copying. Whereas if you trace through what mod sort would do. You would actually copy 1,000 bits or bytes per record. How many times? Log number of element times. Okay. So here you do log an amount of copying of only the indirection area in pause, which is only four bytes per element, and you prepare the permutation array once, and then finally do a one-time implementation of the permutation through cycles. So you'll end up not moving so much data all over the place, log n times, you'll only move it once. Okay. Is the benefit of this clear? So you can reduce data copies in the case that each array element is really large. Yes. And here also we are copying the 
Yes, but that's that that's done only one shot. The every item in data is going to its home in one shot. It just moves once. Of course, you have to move it once. The permutation pause expresses what is the correct sort order, and I'm moving every item of data just one shot to its final destination. Whereas, if you looked at how mod sort was behaving, because it was doing it in runs, each item could be copied log n times. So let's try to implement this and see how it works. So at this point, the pause array is ready. Okay, I'll stop the prints. I'll print the name still. So the final pause array will be printed. And now let's uh, try this one shot permutation copying. Okay, so we'll start off by keeping track of what has already been copied. Okay, remember I covered the cycle of 0, 1, 2, 5, and I can cross off those positions to remember that I'm already done with them. So now, I initialize a Boolean array called copied, and one other way of initializing vectors in the standard C++ library is to give it the number of elements and one value to fill in all those cells. So that prevents a lot, you know, that avoids some work in writing a for loop. So you say I need n cells, each of them initialized to false. So I have not copied anything yet. And then forever, okay, what I mean is until copied becomes entirely true, that's what I really want. Find the next not copied element. And here are some more uh, easy things to use from the algorithms library. So you say not copied position. So find some not copied position. In particular, the leftmost one. You do that by calling the find algorithm. Okay. Between copied begin and copied end, you are looking for false, so something that's not copied. Okay. That returns to you something, and you have to subtract begin to get the offset. It's just like subtracting A or subtracting the character 0. Okay. So we'll see this more as we go into templates. Any collection object has a beginning and an end. The end is abstractly one position beyond the last element. But begin and end are not directly integer types. Okay. So you shouldn't think of begin and end as integers, but find will return you another abstract position in a collection, and you can subtract begin to get an index. I could have done this with a loop. I could have said, you know, go through position by position. If you find false, break the loop and use that value. This is just one line of shorthand for the same thing. So eventually you don't want this kind of trivial loops to paper your code. You want to pick up all these available libraries from the algorithm package and use them so that things become much easier to read and it's less typing, less mistakes to make. Okay. So I find the first not copied position. Now if not copied position is less than zero or greater than equal to nn, then that means all positions have been copied and I can break the infinite for loop here. This is an infinite loop. No initialization, no test condition. Okay. So then break. Otherwise, I remember the beginning of the cycle as NC pause. And I remember names, okay, I think this is wrong. I have to remember the names at NC pause. And now, let me not write it as a while. Uh, let me first write it in a relatively uh, uncivilized fashion. So I'll say again, an uh, infinite for loop. So this is the cycle, cycle shift loop. Whereas this is the loop to find the next not copied element, which is find uh, entry into next uncopied cycle. Okay. So the outer loop finds an entry point into an uncopied cycle, and then the inner loop does the cycle shifting. So how do I do the cycle shift loop? I've already preserved the first element of it. Okay. Now the first thing is I should not be doing the cycle shift if pause of NC pause is 
cycle will begin. Right? So I say if pause of N C pause is equal to cycle begin, then I am done, I should break. Right? Otherwise, what should I do? I should do data of um, N C pause equals data of pause of N C pause. That was the basic cycle shift step. And finally, I have to walk over forward in the cycle one position, and that's equivalent to NC pause equal to pause of NC pause. Is that okay? And just so that we don't lose track of this entirely, uh, I'm going to uh, print things at the end of this. Okay, not, not after every cycle shift, but after one whole cycle. But after I exit the loop, what will I have to do? So I have exited when pause of NC pause became cycle begin. Okay. So now I have to say data of NC pause is equal to the stuff I remembered. So I check that the pause of NC pause is equal to cycle begin, then I have come back to the beginning of the cycle. So I'm not sure this is completely bug free, but let's run it and see. And uh, after all this, I'll always try to print out the, the data array. So suppose I do that. Let's see if it sends off smoke from my machine or whatever. Okay. Uh, data was not declared in this scope, line 57. Uh, it's names, not uh, data. Okay, clearly that wasn't working. Um, let's see. I was trying to, just give me a sec. Um, so I print, uh, okay, so this is the original array, then this is the permutation array. Right? So in the first step, I have, oh, um, I should print uh, not, sorry. That doesn't make sense. Um, let me print out what I'm trying to do, then it will be a little clearer. Let me not uh, print names too rashly. I will uh, write out what is being addressed, assigned here. So I'll say NC pause gets the value from pause NC pause. So if that's wrong, we'll know why it's going wrong. Okay. Hmm? So replaced by. So the contents of names NC pause will be replaced by the contents of pause NC pause. Okay. So I'm just printing out what the swap should be before mistakes are made. So we can debug gradually. So zero, I'll copy one. One, I'll copy two. Two, I'll copy five. Okay, now. 5 while copy 0 is kind of done. So let me print a message for cycle done. Hmm. So this, uh, the copy, cycle yes. You have to set all the others to true as well. That's right. Uh, good uh, observation. So I have to say, I also have to mark all the others as done. So 0 gets 1, 1 gets 2, 2 gets 5, and cycle is done, because 5 loops back to 0. Okay. And then 3 to 4, cycle is done. So now, if I finally get the courage to print out what's happening, okay. So after the first cycle, alligator, giraffe, jackalope, zebra are in 
correct position as we saw in the example, but Wolf and links are still not correctly done. And in the second cycle, I basically swap three and four, and now I get sorted order. So there is a bit of a Josephus problem going on here in that as I am eliminating cycles by marking them to be true, I have to keep doing a linear search in the pause array, in the copied array to find out what remains not copied. So that is an additional complexity. You could try to think of how you can avoid that. So this search over copies, it looks like one line of code, but it's not cheap. Every time I have to scan from the beginning to the end to find out what work is left to do. Can I make that more efficient? Okay. So again, I could try to squeeze out values, but that would be a little painful. So think about that. Any questions so far on basic uh, indirection arrays? So an indirection array computes the index of the highest smallest element in the original data array. And it's basically a permutation. Therefore, you can express a permutation as a bunch of cycles. And even if you are not given an additional array to store all the original data, if you didn't have 2x the amount of space, you could still just hold one temporary records worth of data and permute the whole sequence. Fine. Any questions on this? So indirection arrays are very useful because you can declare them on the same data array depending on what your sort order should be. For example, suppose I have uh, a database conceptually, which has two arrays, each of the same size, CN, and the two arrays have student names and student marks. Okay. Maybe it's a example uncomfortably close to home, but bear with me. So each index, accesses names ix and his or her marks marks ix. And as always mentioned, they have to be ganged. You have to access two of them at the same time. But the names and marks are not in any particular order. Fine. So suppose we want to do some fast querying on any one of them. For example, given a student name, quickly binary search and find the student's marks. Or uh, given a range of marks, report all the students who got marks in that range. Okay. Clearly, if you wanted to solve both problems simultaneously, ordinarily you would have to store them in two different sorted orders. And then you would have to replicate the student names in two places. Okay. But now you can avoid that. Okay. You can avoid that by keeping only the original pristine data unchanged, so name and marks, but you create two indirection arrays on them. One will be for the student names, the other will be for the marks. Okay. So to give a very simple example here, just to make this, this clear. So suppose I have name and I have marks. Okay. And So here are the names and the marks may be something arbitrary. Let's say, I don't know, 14, 2, 11, 5, 9, 7. So suppose those are the respective marks of the students with those names. Okay. So now I can uh, create two pause arrays, names pause and marks pause, okay. or rather let me create names pause on this side, becomes cleaner. Okay. So names pause, the first position has to point to the smallest name. Okay. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so it has to be 2. The second smallest name is B at position 4. Okay. Third smallest name is uh, M at position 5. OK. 
Okay, then we have, is that correct? Uh, no, sorry, one, and then we have three, and finally we have zero. So that will be the n pause array, whereas m pause will be its own order. So M pause will be uh, the smallest marks is here. So M pause will be one, which will go here. Then we'll have uh, three, which is here. Then we have uh, five. Okay. And then we have four. Then we have one. Uh, sorry, two, and then we have zero. So, any questions about this? So, now we know how to compute each of them. Okay. Now, as a software engineering exercise, it seems like a horrible waste if to convert any data record into pause records, you have to write separate code. Ideally, you should be able to write one piece of code which given any record and what key you want to get it sorted by logically, will find a pause array for it, right. So we will see how to do that as generic code once we get into templates much later in the course. Once we know about classes, templates, we can do that. Okay. Now, but can we get back into the kind of queries we would like to uh, answer on this? So we said. Um, find uh, the marks obtained by a given student, right? So how do I do that? Right, so basically you have to look at the names array through the NPOS viewer. And remember this is now sorted. As this increases, names of NPOS of that thing will also increase. And so now we can do binary search. Right. Now, meanwhile, if I had some two marks, M begin and M end, and I wanted to find all students in that range, what would I do? I would use marks, M pause, and I do binary search. So, of course, I assume that that is the case. So what will happen is I will find two positions, M begin and where the marks are between that, okay? And then I will access the records using that, okay? So any questions about how to code it up before we actually get started on it? So let's uh, try this out. You haven't missed much. Okay. Uh, string vector algorithm, etc. And now I say vector string names. Then I do uh, the usual. So suppose I have just five to reduce. Okay. And then I have vector. Uh, say int marks, and then I have so what you learn in the course you should learn in life as well if you are quickly trying to create an example you should double the number of copies you do 11, 5, 9. Okay. So five animals with five marks. 
now, uh, what's the indirection array? Let me uh, dispense with long names and give the exact names as here. so that the example is exact. We can relate back to paper and so on. And then m got uh, 7. Okay, so now we already know the indirection address, so I won't write code to find the indirection address. That's painful. So I'll say, um, say vector int um, n pause. And then pause. So there are various ways of declaring it. Maybe I should play it cheap for the purpose of this lecture and say um, int n pause. Uh, actually, you say something like int what? Int n pause equals something like that. Then you say 2, 4, 5, 1, 3, 0. And similarly, you declare m pause as 1, 3, 5, 4, 2, 0. So there are two uh, columns of your database with individual indices on it called n pause and m pause. Okay. So now, uh, Suppose I want to write a binary search of two names, uh, two uh, marks. Suppose I want to find all students with marks between, uh, say, um, two and, sorry, say five and seven inclusive. Okay. So then I need to do binary search for five. Okay. So let's say uh, int m low equals five, m high equals, um, say, um, the nine. Okay. So now, if I have to search for those positions, how do I go about it? Remember the old binary search code. So this is what it looked like. Okay, low and high and so on. So again, because we haven't learned how to do functions yet, we need to copy and paste the search code twice over. So in fact, uh, this is the low bracket for the low guy. This is the high bracket for the low guy. Okay, and this is the low mark answer. While low bracket for low guy is high bracket for low guy. Okay, the mid bracket for the low guy is that. Okay, I don't print anymore. But now the important thing is that my query here is marks low, okay. So while marks low is less than, what do I do here? I take marks, but I can't do mid. I have to do m pause mid low, okay, another bracket. And if uh, the low marks is greater than the same thing, okay. otherwise if uh, m low is equal to that same thing, So I'll just show one part of it because it's too tiring, and then we'll just, uh, after that you can continue, we'll go on to matrices instead. So answer equal to mid, and so on, right? And then, uh, so I'll print out something. Uh, let's say I print out uh, mid low. Okay, and also answer low. So suppose uh, I want to access the names and marks. So now I say names uh, m pause, not n pause, right? We are searching on m pause now. So I do uh, answer low and uh, the marks m pause again. 
Let's see if this at all works. Probably have a million uh, compiled time trouble. This is name marks. AN. Where is AN? Oh, uh, because uh, see, this is the thing about parameter copying. So this should be um, names dot size minus one. See if that works. So see, I looked for uh, low, which is five. Okay, and five was obtained by y. So I see that y and 5 here. Okay. So I will post this code, you should complete it to find all students who got marks in a particular range. Fine. Yes. We are assuming that the uh, 5 has to be somebody. Ah, so what if no one actually got that mark? Right. That is also an extension that you can do as a practice lab. Uh, when you binary search and your query value falls between two adjacent values, Depending on what your code wants to do, you can choose the left, snap to the left or snap to the right. Okay, and but report that you didn't quite find that value and it snapped. That's what you need from a binary search routine. So the solution is, as I showed in the code, two indirection arrays, n pause and m pause, where names of names pause nx increases with nx, but marks of names pause will not generally. And conversely, marks pause, where marks of marks pause mx will increase with mx, but uh, names of marks pause mx need not. And then you can use these two indices to do all kinds of interesting access on the data, even though the original data has not moved an inch or a bit. Okay. So that's how indirection arrays are organized. So that sort of wraps up what we had to do about the starter problems on 1D vectors, arrays. Okay. Now we'll lift our dimensionality to 2D and get into 2D matrices. Declaration and storage of 2D matrices is very, very similar to declaration of 1D native arrays. So this is the native array way to declare matrices in G++ or C++. So you say, I have an integer matrix. So int is the type of each cell, I mat, and then you give the number of rows and number of columns. Instead of one box bracket, you have two box brackets, okay, as simple as that. And or you can declare a double matrix called dmat, which has again rows and columns. Internally, uh, there is no distinction between 3, 5, and 15. Okay, internally, the storage required for a matrix with three rows and five columns, rows go vertically, columns go horizontally, is indistinguishable from allocating a one dimensional array with 15 elements in it. And uh, C and C++ compilers implement what is called, just called syntactic sugar. It just makes life a little sweet for you, hopefully, by using the information about how many columns we have. Okay. So since you have declared the number of columns, like five, the compiler now knows that if you have to access IMAT at Rx and Cx, then the memory cell you are looking for is the base address of the integer at imat plus calls into rx plus cx. Okay, why that funny multiplication? So here is the picture. So suppose I declared int imat 3, 5. Okay. Internally, so this is number of rows, that is number of columns. And internally, the C++ compiler will logically think of the matrix as three rows and five columns. The columns will be numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The rows will be numbered 0, 1, 2. Okay. But in memory, what will happen is IMAT will start at a particular place. It's integer, so you need four bytes for each element. This is the 0, 0 cell that will be stored in the first integer. And then 0, 1, the next one will be the next 4, okay. 0, 2 would be the next 4 bytes. 
and so on, right up to 2.4, which would take another 4 bytes somewhere. Okay. So 15 cells goes from 0 to 14 integers. Okay. So let us see a basic declaration. So 3 rows, 5 columns, int imat rows calls, same syntax, just simple extension, keep adding dimensions. Now again I will do some address voodoo magic to get the address of the very first 00, zero cell and then turn that into an integer by force, you should not really be doing that, this is all bad, bad illegal things to do, but this gives us a peek into how the memory is organized. That is base and then this is the basic for loop row is 0 to rows, column cx is 0 to calls and I get the absolute address of the rx cx element in the matrix and then I will print the row and the column, I will print the raw address of the current cell in, as an integer and then I will also print address minus base okay, to see just what happens. So I compile that, now when I run it, well the address itself is some arbitrary hex number which happened to have its highest order bit set. So that is why it said minus, but if you are upset with that we can also always do unsigned. Okay, this machine has 1.5 GB RAM and depending on how the address space is organized your address can look negative but it is actually not, that is meaningless. So that is the address. So element 00 has relative address 0, absolute address is that in this particular run. If you run it again, it can change as always. Okay. So element 01 has relative address 4, so 4 bytes forward. I need the first 4 bytes for the 00 element. Element 02 is at relative byte offset 8, 03 is at 12, 04 is at 16. So overall the first 5 elements take 20 bytes starting at 0, 4, 8, 12, 16. So 16 to 19 will be the last element. So byte number 0 through 19 is the first row and then the second row namely row numbered 1 starts and that is just the next position. Okay. So overall I take 15 times 4 or 60 bytes, the last byte is the last element is starting at 56 and going to 56, 57, 58, 59. So bytes 0 through 59 are allocated for this 15 element matrix. So 15 times 4, fine. Now if I change this to say double, okay, nothing should change except for the storage model. So now I take instead of 60 bytes, I will take 120 bytes. The last one is 8 bytes going from 112 to 119. Okay. The element indexes are the same, the storage taken doubles and the storage is addressed exactly like this. The base address is this, if you keep adding the second number you get the absolute byte address in RAM of that array element. Okay. So this is how uh, arrays are organized but if you wanted to assign values to them that is pretty easy. You just write something like imat rx cx equals, I don't know, something, uh, 0 0.5. Sorry. Huh? imat, yeah. So, of course, there is nothing to run. We are not printing anything, but this will compile. Now, if you wanted to, you could always uh, print out the value too. So, I will just combine that here. Sort of silly. Um, old habits, uh, cx. Okay. So you access a value and you write into a value exactly with the same notation as before, except that a new index is stuck into another pair of box brackets. Okay. So all the all the cells are 0 0.5. Okay. And as far as native array declaration and initialization goes, that is pretty much it, there is nothing else you need to know. Okay. 
But once again, note that this knowledge that the uh, 2D array had three rows and five columns is lost immediately after this statement. So C++ compiler and runtime system is not going to remember this for you. You have to hang on to rows and columns for dear life. And earlier it was just storing one number. This time it's actually vital to store both numbers because the way the compiler figures out that 0, 2 has relative address 16 is by remembering that there are five things. If you go into the second row, it has to understand that the first row had five things. Because the arithmetic it's doing here depends on multiplying the number of columns. So let me show it here. So if I write another relative cell number in here, so that is cell 0, that is 1, 2, 3, 4, but now it's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. Then the cell number of ij is equal to what? 5 into i plus j. So for example, cell of 2, 3 is equal to 5 into 2 plus 3, which is equal to 13. Cell number 2, 3. So that's why the C++ compiler has to be always told that the array had five columns. Without that knowledge, it's just a one-dimensional byte array. So this creates infinite misery if you want to pass 2D arrays into functions. It's almost impossible to write functions which can accept native arrays of any size because the column information is hardware and it's outside the array itself. Okay. So for all these reasons, although we could sort of live with native one-dimensional arrays, I just don't like to deal with native two-dimensional or multi-dimensional arrays at all because that knowledge of 5 is going to haunt you when you write functions. You have to keep passing it in, you have to keep pretending that the 2D array is actually a 1D array. So why pretend? So what's happened is that there is this uh, other library you can use called boost, okay, which gives you all of this. So you can include boost libraries using a more complicated looking path. Okay, so you say include boost numeric, this is basic linear algebra. Okay. And then you say I want matrices, I want IO4 matrices. Okay. And these two will basically give you all the basic stuff you need for 2D matrices. Okay. So for example, you can say, okay, now note that I have not used a default namespace yet here. And you can now start using the namespace called boost numeric u plus. This actually follows exactly that path. Okay, so all these classes or types are registered inside this namespace. And anyway, so you can forget about those details. You can say I want a matrix of doubles, which is m, which is size 3 by 3. Okay. And now you get two methods called size 1 and size 2, by which you can get the rows and columns. So next time I will we'll go on to study boost in some more detail before starting matrix algorithms.